of Engineers and Chromatographs. I suppose is the title. I'll probably change it when I actually upload this thing. But 1980s, I was hired into a company called Ten Us Chemicals, Tenneco and U.S. Steel Joint Venture, to produce uh, phthalic anhydride and 2-ethylhexanol. Phthalic anhydride is called is a plasticizer. It's a base product for many other plastics, depending on what you mix with it after that. But we began producing the highest quality phthalic anhydride in the world and produced, at the time, was one third of the world's plastic requirements when we turned on and got rolling. So what does it mean to be offered a position as a chemical engineer in a chemical plant. The inputs to the phthalic anhydride plant was orthoxylene, a very interesting chemical with an interesting history. Basically, it burns and makes plastic. That plastic will settle on cars if it's out in the wild or the environment or settle in lungs. But done properly and contained, it makes plastic for your jugs in your cars. The Saturn line of vehicles was dependent upon the quality of this type of plastic, so there's a little tie-in if you remember the Saturn cars. So three years in a uh, chemical production facility. The 2-ethylhexanol is a type of oil used in the steel production industry. It's a type of pipe coating, a lubricant for processing, and so that plant as well was no small thing. The two were side by side and shared what's called the process control room, which was a, an explosion proof building containing the computers that ran the plant. My ace in the hole on the job interview and resume was I had vast experience with digital equipment computers, deck computers, the PDP and the VAX series of computers. Knew them very well from a previous short-term job. The other advantage I had is knowing instrumentation. While I did not know the specifics of almost any of the plant's instrumentation, they were end measurement devices. I do know the specifics of how those devices work. How they were integrated into something as large as this was another question, right? The, the system, why? Why would you buy gas chromatographs and stick them out in a production environment? So the main house we had for gas analyzers was a separate building. It was a 15-minute walk from the explosion-proof control room facility that housed the computers and the operators. It was a little little building looked like a uh, uh, what a tractor trailer type of uh, cargo box sitting out there with a big tower off the side of it for air intake the building had auga horns on the side of it it was a I believe it was the NEMA 3 class enclosure meaning it had to be pressurized positive pressure ventilated from the far exterior, introduced from the far exterior of the building, in this case, up above any vapor plumes from a process damage. So the building was pressurized. When you opened the door, when you went to close the door, you had to pull against pressurization. And you had to turn the lights on because there were no windows to this house. NEMA 3 requirement is an interesting read, interesting learn. It has to do with industrial explosion hazard requirements. In this type of environment, you have to do this to house these analyzers. So there's a pricey little building, also climate controlled, marginally, didn't have to be. And inside that building were basically seven refrigerators initially, little refrigerators. They were the size of, these are processed gas analyzers. These ones were manufactured by Bendix as a system and training was provided by Bendix on those as a system. <clears throat> they respect and designed 
The whole instrument house was designed long before I got on board the project. This was a commissioning phase, starting up the plant. So these analyzers were being turned on for the first time. Processes were being turned on and gases flowing that weren't there the day before. Temperatures that were not there the week before. So these process analyzers sit there 24 hours a day and sample gas off of discrete systems out in the process. The first system we had was a syngas generator. This is a pretty interesting Google. You burn methane basically, but it's probably not methane. It's probably methane plus some other things because you pay for the purity of the methane that you buy. One gas analyzer was committed to looking at that single reactor and identifying the gas stream out of it identified seven different gas components that were predominant. There could have been others, but they were below detectable limits of that analyzer. What was unique about that? That analyzer was maintained at a high temperature, well, the whole room's analyzers. These were not refrigerators, they were all heated cabinets to maintain gas as a vapor and not as a liquid. So the cabinet temperatures inside were anywhere from 140 up to 470 degrees Fahrenheit. Two of my process analyzers on the phthalic anhydride stream making plastic analyzed gas, analyzed plastic as a gas. Plastic contained as a vapor in a process trail. All the sample lines had to be maintained above 340 something degrees, I believe, is the vapor point, the melting point of phthalic anhydride. The process ran much hotter than that. So, that side of the plant, phthalic anhydride plastic manufacturing, had two analyzers because it had two rea reactors taking a sample and analyzing about every two and a half minutes. Each of these analyzers had about a two and a half minute cycle time and then you had sample lines running to the instrument. So sample lag might be a total of five minutes. When you get that information it's already some level of minutes old versus some real-time monitors, different types of instruments out there in the process that capture much faster. All of these timing instances are noted. They're ma they matter somewhere else in process measurements and controls. How do you control the actions of the reactor? Changing temperatures, flow rates, mix rates, feed rates, exit rates, tuning exit rates. This is done over weeks, months, and even years of looking at data just to get those minuscule process and quality improvements out of a process. So for three years the morning deal was go in and look for a disaster ticket, see if there's anything you have to respond to, and then go out and visit process analyzers across uh, acres of an industrial complex. You climb up towers and check sample point pressures, and you create lists for maintenance folks to continue and do these things and why they're doing them and the two points that need to be checked on these process sample lines. One somewhere up hidden in a process might take a half hour to climb to and look at and another one down in that sample house. A few measurements written down in order to inform a technician what these settings should be in normal circumstances and if they have changed you need to go find out why. You try to maintain the stability of the, the base functions, principles of that instrument at a constant for accuracy of the instrument and long-term measurements. Some of the lab instruments I ran across had years worth of data for temperature stability and instrument stability. It was part of certification processes required to get many, many digits of accuracy and proofs. Previous, <laughs> previous video mentioned calculus and kind of how important it is. Calculus uses these things called proofs. When you start asking, well, how does this work? You will get led into proofs. 
and you could call it a rabbit hole because it's confusing as uh, it can be storytelling. It requires blackboards and books and studying in order to understand where the proofs came from and their foundations in order to understand the calculus that drives the casino we ride on. So this is every day, five days a week, checking these analyzers or looking at the analyzers and the data they're providing. The analyzers have scheduled calibration cycles. We specified and ordered gas that matched what we thought the process was supposed to have as a standard. And once a day, once every three days, we would inject a calibration sample into the gas lines and see if the instruments saw what they should be. That's called instrument certification. You might have to go back and recalibrate an instrument based on the certification and then make notes for the next operator, the next technician to go against it when he's trying to troubleshoot or diagnose a gas chromatograph. What was new to me in gas chromatography was the switching in the columns used in gas. They're fractioning columns, they're capillary columns. There's different ways of getting gases to separate. And there's different videos that show how these separations can or can't work. But uh, capillary columns would be interesting to look up if you like looking up fractioning columns, diatomaceous columns, uh, there's lots of things these are called. One of our columns separated hydrogen off the top of a gas stream. 99.9% .9 pure hydrogen for use elsewhere in a process stream. Hydrogen extraction from CO2. Is that what some folks are proposing for this hydrogen world that some are, some are talking about? Ah well, you see these little holes in the ground might have rabbits or other things. Big world. That didn't help. <laughs> Sorry.